Well, I guess everyone has an anchor somewhere. With Joe, it's the Palace of Twilight. With Jitin, it's the Great Deku Tree. And with Warren, it's inside Jabu Jabu's belly. With me, it happens to be the most popular dungeon in Majora's Mask. Yep, it's that one. And it just so happens to be Joe's top favorite dungeon. Wait a second. Disclaimer number one. This is not a definitive list, nor is it a fact. It's only our opinions, and our opinions, just like anyone's, are all different. For example, something that I may have at number one might be last on Jason's, for example. Hmm. Pretty clever, Joe. Pretty clever. I... Honestly, don't know what to make of this. I mean, we've seen some contrasting opinions here, as you well know, but this is literally as different as you can get. The Stone Tower Temple, I think everyone can agree it's a place like no other, no matter what you think of it. I think I'll say my words and then let Jason say his, and you guys can pick which side you're on. Okay, well first off, my immediate thoughts when going into this place was how big and imposing it was. I mean, there are loads of different rooms and the variety was huge. It took full advantage of all three of the main masks, which made it both tougher and more creative. But don't get me wrong, it's not like the other final dungeons in the series. The Deku sections bore almost no similarities to Woodfall, the Goron sections and Snowhead had virtually no connection whatsoever, and the Zora sections took advantage of the Zora suit in ways that Great Bay didn't even come close to. This isn't just a compilation of changed rooms from previous temples, this is something entirely new and entirely different, and I loved it for that. Not to mention flipping the entire temple around and experiencing it from a different side altogether. Stone Tower, you get top marks from me. Your turn, Jason. So, here I am trying to think of analogies or to try and flesh this out more into why I don't like this dungeon, but I think it's better to keep it to simple sentences. We'll be here forever. Well, quite honestly, I didn't find anything impressive about it, and when I 100%ed through this game a month ago, I honestly found it a really boring dungeon. I find this place more boring than I do hating the Great Bay Temple at number 34. The details are not to my liking at all, which is the bluish hue and weird wall textures. The puzzles didn't impress me, felt they were more mask rush puzzles or had puzzles that didn't take a lot of thinking to get past them. Like for example with this block puzzle being the easiest puzzle in the game to figure out in my opinion. The mini bosses I felt were pretty weak. One had a simple strategy of jumping out of the way and the other involved spamming your light arrows to win. Now the last part, the temple flipping over. I personally feel it caused a huge problem that it did in creating a unique second floor to the dungeon. First, the horrendous backtracking. I went through this dungeon four times. The first time to beat the mini boss and get the light arrows. The second time to finish it. The third time to get a stray fairy or two when I had to flip it right side up again. And the fourth to flip it upside down again to reach the boss. There's backtracking in every dungeon. It's inevitable. But I seriously think they pushed it into the red zone having to go all the way back outside to flip it over. If they had switches inside to flip it over regularly, I wouldn't have this problem. And then this would have jumped about 5 to 10 ranks on my list. But they don't. It's like trying to use an elevator inside of a building but needing to go all the way outside of the building to press the button to get it moving. It's a questionable mechanic to me. So let's add this up. I had to play the Elegy of Emptiness 21 times on my side total in this area. I kept track. Didn't mind the repetition, just took forever to get past simple obstacles. Weak detail and puzzles I had to put up with, with a double whammy with the two sides of the temple to go through. Bad mini bosses. Straight fairies that becomes tedious central in 100%ing this game with needing to flip the entire temple twice to get all of them. I backtracked through this entire dungeon four times. And the final nail. Guess what could wipe your entire progress if you don't get this done in time when 100% in completing it which I had to do. I'm sorry but that time limit is the worst mechanic I've ever seen throughout the entire Zelda series. When it comes to dungeons in my opinion, it needs to burn or not be there when in dungeons. I am not a fan of progress possibly getting lost in video games. I see it in Zelda 2 with game overs. And it's far worse here in Majora's Mask with its time limits because of the longer time spent in dungeons. And thank goodness I didn't have to lose an hour in this dungeon because because I used a 100% strategy guide. Don't want to think about the alternative if I didn't have a strategy guide. <laughs> What's a coincidence that the dungeon right after my number one happens to be Jason's all-time favorite? It's one that you don't see at the top very often, but it's certainly one that tweaked the water dungeon formula in fun ways, even if I wasn't a big fan of it myself. It's the Lake Bed Temple from Twilight Princess.
Aw, oh, man. Joey, you can't expect me to adjust that quickly from my top worst to my top best just like that. Man, you're having a heyday in this part ever since I did that dog food thing. Guess I deserved it. First the hidden rule message and now this. Just like last time, and I don't want to fly into a ranch because of time for this part, I'll keep my reasons straightforward. When it comes to the lake bed temple, I love water. And to mix that in with a lot of what Twilight Princess is capable of in terms of graphics and atmosphere, then it's a no brainer that this made my number one spot. The graphics in the underwater sections of the dungeon is awe inspiring and the detail looks great on the walls and textures. Fun fact, I actually finished playing this dungeon just last week at my brother's house and I thought at first that this dungeon was aging until I remembered why I loved it so much. Of how complicated it can get to get you thinking. At which unlike the water temple from Ocarina of Time, it can still stump me in a few places and kick my butt. And loving confusing dungeons and puzzles plus with the full potential of the graphics of Twilight Princess bringing the best in the water, the layout, and the haunting music, it gets full marks from me out of anything else the Zelda series can provide in a 3D Zelda dungeon. Okay, well before I say my opinion on Lake Bad, I've got a little confession to make. I'm not exactly huge on Twilight Princess. While the dungeons were great, and I mean great, I found the overworld to be bland, graphics to be too dark for their own good, and the first three hours of the game to be abysmal. However, the one part of the game that I utterly despised is the Lake Hylia Tears of Light section. By the time I'd finished spending hours tracking them all down, I just wanted to be rid of water and everything about it, and then they hit me with the Lake Bed Temple. So, as you can imagine, I wasn't exactly big on water when I entered this place. However, in some ways, I found it to be surprisingly good. I love the claw shot, and hanging from the ceiling was always fun, not to mention the temple itself was beautiful. However, it was still repetitive, frustrating, and confusing, and the stairs, while a good idea, seemed a little bit pointless in my opinion, as they were barely used, and when they were, I found it to be pretty ambiguous, which is why my placement of Late Bird drags it below the top ten. Wow, three in a row. Holy cow, now we've come across Warren's number one favorite 3D Zelda dungeon of all time. And fortunately, I've talked to him about it before, so I can speak from his perspective why the Forest Temple from Twilight Princess is so special for him. The Forest Temple from Twilight Princess is actually a really creative and imaginative dungeon, possibly more so than any other first dungeon in the series. However, the reason I placed it so low isn't because the idea was bad or anything, no, I love the concept. It's just that, for a first dungeon, it was really hard and confusing, and although the first few hours of the game leading up to this did allow me to get used to the controls, it didn't prepare me for this. This isn't the main reason the temple didn't cut it for me though. Basically, once you collect the monkeys, they make some kind of chirping noise and beckon you on the right track. However, I didn't know this or notice it, so I had almost no idea where to go, which really prevented me from enjoying this place, even if it was due to my own stupidity. A great temple, but the ranking is based on how much we enjoyed them, and I've only beaten Twilight Princess once. That means that I didn't enjoy this temple, but I've only got myself to blame. We've all been there, Joe. It's what happened with me with the Snowhead Temple from Majora's Mask. Everyone is tripped over a puzzle because we weren't in the right mindset and hit ourselves in the head. Anyways, back to the Force Temple. I remember Warren talking to me about how impressed he was with how well the first temple is executed in Twilight Princess. He continued on about how fantastic the non-linearity of the dungeon was and at how it excelled the exploration being presented here compared to the other dungeons. This is speaking for me personally responding to Warren, but I have to say he's right. After you leave the monkeys in the main room of the dungeon, you're on your own to choose from the three bridges in the middle of the dungeon to find the rest of the monkeys and it will keep you busy for a while. Plus you're learning the mechanics of the game and the standards of the dungeon to boot to keep the interest going. I have to agree with Warren with this as well. I personally think this is the best first dungeon that a 3D Zelda game can bring out, especially where the other first dungeons ended up on the list. I can't speak for anyone else personally, just like Joe was explaining here, and it's not a favorite for some. But hey, every dungeon is different for everyone. That's the way it goes, but here it is, Warren's favorite 3D Zelda dungeon. Now, where's Jitten's? The only one left here we haven't seen yet. Wow, the top 10. For a dungeon to make it this far, it's got to be seriously good, and in our opinion, Wind Waker's Earth Temple most certainly is.
This is where Wind Waker's graphics are at their best for me. A deep, dark dungeon and it makes Link and the environment looks fantastic here and how it stands out in the cell shaded graphics. I can't speak for everyone as I've heard the other side and saying it looks horrible, but for me it's the best mix of lighting to make the presentation outstanding and some of the best in what the Zelda universe has to offer visually. I think I like the Earth Temple the same reason I love the Fire Temple from Ocarina of Time. For me the puzzles aren't too impressive, but they don't necessarily need to be to get the full enjoyment out of this dungeon. The dungeon's huge charm comes out of the environment I just described. The little details like the enemies here and Medley, come on. She's pretty darn adorable and in my opinion was executed really well. Can't say the same for Joe though. I'm trying to think of more to say but this is one of those dungeons that's like a haunted house. You don't talk about what's in here, you just let it all sink in. And in my opinion, this is the best dungeon where you let your eyes run off and have a good time. If you think that's weird to picture, then let's talk about those warm skeleton hugs those guys love to give Link in here. As for me, I think that the Earth Temple brought us some of the most unique puzzles in the series with the Mirror Shield, and Madeline was an awesome character. However, it's her that gives me the temple's main problem in my opinion, and it's the same reason that I wasn't a great fan of the Wind Temple. Her controls are just too finicky and annoying to control, not to mention her flying was painfully slow. Still, the temple had great atmosphere and a good difficulty, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. I'm actually surprised that this got high, despite that it gave it super high marks. I don't know, it's one of those dungeons where I thought those one or two mechanics in the dungeon would have put it down lower by others, but okay. I guess the magnetic boost was well favored in the Goron mines from Twilight Princess amongst the four of us. I'll take it. Well, fire dungeons have never really been anything Nintendo struggled with, but they really outdid themselves here. Goron Mines is our overall favourite fire dungeon in the series, and for good reasons. For me, it gave off this authentic vibe that no other dungeon in the game seemed to give, and the bow, combined with the iron boots, provided us with some really inventive puzzles, especially for a dungeon this early in the game. But, I do have one major complaint with this dungeon, which is this. I mean, would it have killed them to make the iron boots just a bit faster? Especially seeing as you're spending at least a third of the dungeon using them. One of the minor complaints that I have with Goro Mines is that it's quite short, only ever taking about 45 minutes to complete. But still, a very enjoyable place with two very enjoyable items used in even more enjoyable ways. Not to mention, guessing the boss key in three different parts was a very welcome change, and it shows that deviating from the traditional formula can pay off in extremely good ways. To me, the Goron Mines is the biggest eye-opener when it comes to details, as in it invites your eyes to stare at certain things like the rising geyser at the beginning of the dungeon, or looking at the distortion of the air when you're above the lava. It complements a nice unique charm and makes a wonderful addition to the Twilight Princess roster of dungeons. Now as for everything else, well, Joe already talked about the three sections of the key, and it's kind of linear like the Temple of Time. It's something I've observed is that you'll find those three key segments in no time with the layout of the dungeon. Now, the magnetic boots. I can't get around that it is a flaw for others and that's perfectly okay to think that just like the iron boots from the water temple hmm i don't think i can explain this one the critics are right it does take forever and it's logical that i should hate it too because of that but i think the best way i can sum up why i didn't mind it is because the dungeon looks great to look at like i referenced earlier and there was a nice balance between you wearing the boots and not having them if it dragged down for the entire dungeon then i'd have a problem with it but thankfully it gives you plenty of breathing room and it's pretty darn unique item how how often can you say in the Zelda series that a magnetic platform abruptly yanks you up to the ceiling through your boots or lets you walk on walls? And that's why I love it. So far, this series has had quite a few two-on-two -two battles, but this is one of the rare times that Jason and I have actually allied with each other and had the same opinion. None of us actually dislike Forbidden Woods from Wind Waker, but for me and Jason at least, it was one of the most unmemorable dungeons in the whole series. This one...
didn't do it for me. I think the positives are decent with the Deku Leap and the Flower Jumping, which is why I have it at number 23, but I personally felt a lot more involved with the Deku Leap and the Wind Temple. Here it was like, jump here, then jump here, then jump over there, which isn't very interesting to me, especially since it reminded me of being a Deku Scrub from Majora's Mask. I can't remember the music to this dungeon, it's very unmemorable. To me, the place was very forgetful, and the obstacles didn't really stand out to me, including with the boomerang. I think the boomerang is my least favorite item in Wind Waker. I didn't get into the charm of it like other Zelda items. Overall decent and pretty good at number 23, but it's probably the dungeon I've forgotten about the most in the series, honestly. Obviously, and on the other side, Jitten and Warren soared this dungeon into their top 10s, making it rank 8 overall. But surprisingly from that rank, Joe didn't find a lot of fondness in this place either. I think I've mentioned this before, but I really, really like the Deku Leaf. It's super fun to glide in various directions with the wind behind you, and being shot out of the flowers was lots of fun. The problem is that, although Forbidden Woods had some fun concepts, none of them were really memorable or unique, and it's not a place that I really look forward to going to again. If they'd used the Deku Leaf for more than just jumping across slightly longer gaps and spinning switches, I would have enjoyed the place a lot more, but they didn't, and I didn't.